We are well into the Helldivers 2 launch and hundreds of thousands of players across the world are dropping on the hostile planets and attempting to spread glorious democracy to all. The unfortunate truth is there are a lot of people out there making some really big mistakes and probably forcing missions to end in total failure. My name is Kodiak, this is Legacy Gaming, and today we're sharing our list for Helldiver 2 mistakes you need to start avoiding, like yesterday. So let's just put everything into perspective. The Legacy team has put a ton of time into this game. Myself and Livid are easily clearing some of the hardest missions in Helldivers 2, and our experience with pickup groups has been positive. But as you no doubt know, when things go bad, they go really bad. So we put together 10 mistakes you absolutely need to know about before ever dropping into a mission. If there's one thing that drives me nuts, it's when people don't communicate in a multiplayer game. There are a handful of ways to accomplish this in Helldivers 2, and they don't even require you to throw on a headset and have an active conversation with another human. Although, that does become more essential in the harder difficulties. If voice comms just isn't your thing and I hear you, you still have options, and you better use them or risk provoking the ire of the rest of your squad. In a mission, you should be using your minimap to effectively plot your team's course. Someone needs to take this on, be it the party host or someone else. There should be someone on the team dropping pins to determine where the squad moves to next. Not only does this clear up any confusion as to where people are going, but it also pushes the team to keep moving. With no markers on the map, it's very easy to slip into aimlessness, and as we'll talk about in another tip, that can lead to a quick death. TLDR, someone needs to call the shots, and using the map and markers is the best way to do that. You can also use the comms wheel to great effect. By holding down R1 on a PS5 controller or Q on a keyboard, you'll bring up the comms radio wheel. To me, the most valuable callouts here are follow me, which can help get the team moving, as well as need supplies. If you're running with a support player, someone who's using the supply pack, or you just need ammo, stims, or grenades, it's important to let the team know that. Ultimately, your team's communication will be the single most important factor in determining your success. Sure, weapons and stratagems matter, but it's going to come down to coordination and making sure your squad is playing like a unit, not four individual Helldivers. In the spirit of teamwork, let's talk about your squad's loadout. This is another pitfall that's easy to fall into, and while it doesn't always have an immediate impact on your team's success, it's certainly a factor long term. When playing in a group, it's important to be flexible. Your loadout can't be the only loadout you play, because in some situations, not having a balanced squad is going to mean a very short and unsuccessful run. Here's a perfect example. On any difficulty past five, you'll have to start dealing with more armored enemies. If your team isn't equipped for those scenarios, then armored foes are going to quite literally trample you. You might not want to play with the recoilless or the auto cannon, but your other option is to die five minutes into a mission. When preparing to drop, make sure you take a quick glance at your team's full loadout. Don't just instantly pop in your favorite stratagems because chances are it's not going to synergize perfectly with the rest of the team. I'd once again implore communication, but I realize that's not always possible. Look, this is about ambition, the ambition to keep the Helldivers 2 community positive and thriving, and that means adapting to whatever situation that you're in. Don't forget, each run is completely different, so not only is there an opportunity for you to adjust, but a chance for you to work with your entire team so that you have a truly effective loadout. For example, the Eagle Napalm Airstrike is insanely good on the Terminates front, but not as effective on the Automaton front. Flip that on its head and consider something like the Shield Generator Relay, which creates a dome and protects your team from projectiles. That's really good on the Automaton front, but provides almost no value on the Terminates front. This extends to backpack stratagems as well. For example, not everyone on the team needs the supply pack call-in equipped mainly because you can call in multiple throughout a round. One member of the squad picks up the first supply pack, then a second member picks up the second one a few minutes later, and thus the wealth is spread amongst the team. The caveat to all of this is that sometimes you can only adjust so much to the needs of your team, and you should never truly cripple your own build just to try and correct any imbalances across the entire squad. It's a balancing act, one that can quickly go awry, so be sensitive to the needs of the team without making radical adjustments, which will ultimately yield the same disastrous results. This next one is quick, and it has to do with using boosters. 
It's amazing how many people we see that are level 20 and beyond that don't equip these during pre-mission loadouts, and it's honestly perplexing. For those that don't know, boosters can be purchased from the Requisition Center. These inconspicuous cylinders actually provide massive team-wide benefits when equipped, and the more the team has active, the more buffs everyone receives. You're no doubt spending tons of medals on weapons and armor, so be sure to check out each booster that's available. To equip a booster, you need to click on this hexagonal UI element here, and then select the booster you want to activate. The team can't have multiple copies of the same booster active, so if you're the higher level player, consider using a booster that's further along in the progression system, so that frees up the easier to access boosters for someone else that's lower level. All right, that's enough prep work, let's jump into a mission because there is plenty we can talk about here. The first mistake I see players make over and over again is dropping stratagems on their teammates. If I had a dollar for every time I witnessed or was the victim of this issue, I'd be a pretty wealthy guy. This is simple, think before you throw. You don't have to throw your stratagem as soon as you finish the sequence. Give yourself a second to look around at your team, make sure you have a clear area to deploy the stratagem, and then throw. On the flip side, as a team member, you simply need to be looking for red stratagem lasers at all time. Accident or not, you also can't be naive and run around without a care in the world. If your squad mate calls down a bombardment and you go running in right after, that's on you friend, not your fellow Helldiver. Where this gets a little gray is with things like incendiary mines and the mortar sentry. Now, I'll be honest, the mortar is one of my favorite stratagems and a big part of our early game support build we showcase on the channel but the mortar has a mind of its own and it requires coordination. Rule of thumb is to never call down the mortar when enemies are close to your team. If the enemy pressure is high, the mortar is simply going to wipe your team. That's almost a guarantee. The mortar is best used as a proactive call-in when you want to thin the herd of enemies that aren't yet attacking, usually at a point of interest. This next mistake is so easy to make, most times you don't even know you're making it. It's especially challenging when you're running with a random squad and there's very little communication. What I'm talking about is staying too long in one particular firefight. This is more relevant the harder the difficulty and it's absolutely something I'm guilty of myself. Where you're most likely going to get sucked into a prolonged fight is during a bug breach or a bot drop. If you're not careful, these can drag on for way longer than they should and it's because you get stuck in the mindset that you have to kill everything before you move on. That's simply not true. If directly in your path, deal with the majority of the enemies. You need to kill enough of them so that you and your team can maneuver without issue. Once you give yourself that breathing room though, find the next objective on the map and start running. Enemies will follow, but for the most part, you create a relatively long train of enemies that will filter in slowly so that you can take them out with relative ease. I also wanna mention that it's very possible to prolong encounters at terminate hides and automaton bases, anywhere enemies can continuously spawn. It's not so much about how long you fight there, but how long you fight without eradicating hives and destroying buildings. The longer you wait, the more enemies you have to contend with, and most minor enemies, the ones that are being spawned, can call in reinforcements through bug breaches and bot drops. So you see, it's a cycle, and the longer these things stay up, the longer you'll end up fighting and possibly dying. So even if things are hectic, your number one priority should be to blow these spawn points up as soon as possible. I love this next mistake because it's one I see people make constantly and it's the perfect representation of how a small change can go a long way. Throughout a mission, you'll frequently encounter patrols. These small groups of bugs or robots aren't immediately aggroed or actively fighting you and that right there is the key. A lot of players will just unload on them and soon that small pack of enemies is calling in reinforcements and you're soon overwhelmed. So why bother attacking them? If your positioning is bad and that patrol butts up close to another POI, well then you run the risk of dealing with multiple packs of enemies on different fronts. Not good. The goal is to never engage patrols, but if that happens, you should always aim to kill the pack in three to four seconds, or at the very least, everyone needs to be watching for that one terminid or bot signaling for reinforcements. Whether it's the bug that spews poison in the air or the bot that shoots up that red beacon, your team will have a very short amount of time to kill them before things get more chaotic. One thing you can do to alleviate this is to run the SC-34 Infiltrator armor, which is currently ranked as one of the best performing armor sets in the game. Mind you, at the time of making this video, armor mitigation is currently broken, so that's a larger part of the equation here, 
but the fact that this armor reduces the range enemies can detect you by 30% is huge. Now, this won't mean much if your teammate is a big dum-dum and decides to attack the patrol anyways, but it certainly can help avoid attention. When the bullets start flying, the last thing you want to do is run around like a chicken with your head cut off. But truthfully, guerrilla tactics are a huge part of the Helldivers 2 experience. Very rarely can you ever just stand your ground and fend off an army of enemies, especially in the harder difficulties. The reality is you're going to have to shoot and move a lot, and the worst thing you can do when things get hairy is run in front of your allies. Sounds simple enough, but I can't tell you how many times a squad mate has decided to run directly in front of me while I'm firing away with my shotgun. Where this gets really tricky is during those high intensity moments where you're not simply running through an open field, but navigating difficult terrain and under all manner of conditions, such as day-night cycles and variable visibility conditions. A good tip is to use the marking system to identify high priority targets or even where your team should reposition. This could cut down on any potential confusion. It's your job as a Helldiver never to shoot your teammate in the back of the skull but it's equally important to not be the player that runs in front of the line of fire. Next, let's talk about hotspots and secondary objectives. I see a lot of new players making the same mistake, not clearing out every enemy hotspot and secondary objective on the map. You wouldn't leave a crisp $20 bill on the table, so why would you ignore requisition points, experience, and potential medals and super credits? When mapping out your mission, you should always think about the most efficient way to move around the map. The goal is to never have to double back and revisit an area of the map you've already explored, and while that's not usually possible because of where the game places the extraction point, you can optimize your course. As soon as you drop in, you should be mapping out your run, hitting every single hotspot on your way to the primary objectives. Usually, a run can boil down into simply going clockwise or going counterclockwise and stopping at every objective and point of interest on the way. But for whatever reason, some players just beeline for the main objective and others straight up walk past secondary objectives. Again, you're leaving resources on the table and in some cases, those secondary objectives provide huge value. For example, completing a radio tower objective will reveal all points of interest on the map, which means easy medals and super credits. Likewise, by activating and stocking the Seif artillery, you get a new stratagem that can quite literally save your life during a mission. Take this moment, for example, where we call down the Seif mini nuke to take out a Bile Titan. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. Hotspots and secondary objectives should be done on every run, no exception. Okay, well, there is an exception, and that's when you're running on the harder difficulties, have a ton of samples on you, and you're starting to get overrun. Then it's okay to do the main objective and extract, but that's only because you stand to lose more than you have to gain. I hate to keep beating the drum on this, but almost everything in Helldivers 2 comes down to coordination and communication. In this case, we're talking about the reduced impact of calling in multiple stratagems at the same time. In the context of this game, stratagems are special abilities, and you use those in special circumstances to kill enemies or buff your team. It's just that simple. The problem is, if you and a squad mate use two stratagems at the same time, you've most likely completely negated the impact of at least one of those call-ins. Think about eagle stratagems for a second. In very rare or extraordinary scenarios, will you need to have two eagle strikes at the exact same location at the exact same time? Maybe in the last two difficulties, but even then you'd want to assess the damage before deploying a second stratagem. The same could be said for turrets. Do you really need a Gatling, auto cannon, and rocket sentry all around the same point of interest at the same time? Probably not. Overlapping stratagems isn't a big deal in the moment, but will come back around to bite you in the ass later in the mission when you're dealing with another tough situation and you have nothing left to fall back on and call in. If nothing else, always wait just a second and look around to see what your team is doing right before you call in a stratagem. Of course, if you're on voice comms, this is almost a non-issue, but for the purpose of this video, I'm assuming that's not a majority of the players. While not a mistake outright, I think it's really important that players realize that not only does the game get more challenging the higher you crank the difficulty, but the worlds themselves and the missions you embark on have unique modifiers that should drastically change your approach to fighting. For example, some planets have intense heat conditions that increase stamina drain and speed up heat build on all weapons. 
In this instance, you definitely don't want to drop in with energy weapons, as they won't be nearly as effective. However, on a planet with extreme cold, those energy-based weapons perform better, because standard guns have a reduced rate of fire, and there's a delay in heat buildup, which is beneficial to energy weapons. Once you start cranking up the difficulty, you'll also see operation modifiers, which further complicate things. On the Terminid front, you can see missions that have the Atmospheric Spores modifier, which means large parts of the map are covered in a thick smog until you kill the Spore Towers. On the Automaton side, operation modifiers like Complex Stratagem Plotting increases your call-in time by 100%. These are all things you have to account for as a player and pay attention to if you're joining a random squad. You should be adjusting your loadout accordingly and, more sparingly, using stratagems because much like some of the other mistakes we've talked about, these things end up haunting you mid-mission, possibly resulting in a failed operation. So there you have it, 10 mistakes we think every Helldiver should avoid. If there's something you think we should have included on our list, leave us a comment down below and help us spread glorious democracy to our friends across the world. If you're still struggling with Helldivers 2 and you're still looking for a little help, check out this video here, which breaks down 10 more tips and tricks we wish we had known sooner about the game. My name is Kodiak, and from everyone here at Legacy Gaming, thanks for watching and play on.